hasn't ventured outside on a dark night, lain down on the grass, and marveled at the majesty of the heavens above. From a dark spot like the summit of Mount Achaia, where the Keck telescope scanned the skies, you can see thousands of stars with your naked eye. And something else if you know what to look for. A faint band of light stretches across the heavens. Have you seen it? Have you wondered what it is, like our ancestors doubtless did for thousands of years before us? Today we know that that faint band of light is the accumulated sum of billions of stars that are too faint and far away for us to make out individually. But our ancestors looked at them in wonder. Today we know that that galaxy that those stars form is the Milky Way, one of billions of such galaxies distributed throughout the universe. But just a hundred years ago, we had no idea that they were out there. We knew of only one galaxy, our Milky Way, and we thought it was the entire universe. We had little idea how big it was, what shape it was. The quest to understand our galaxy and our place within it took astronomers nearly a century to complete. And the game changer was a diagram that starts with the most fundamental properties of the stars and eventually leads to explaining how they live and die. This is its story. It begins with looking at the stars. What do you notice when you look at the sky? Probably what you notice are the patterns that the stars make. This particular group of stars, for example, is known as the constellation Orion, prominent in the wintertime sky. But this pattern is purely temporary. If we were to go somewhere else within our galaxy, or if we were to wait a short time, like a few hundred thousand years, this pattern would change. It's not permanent. So look past the pattern. Think like a scientist. What else do you see in the picture? You might notice that the stars come in different brightnesses, some bright, many others faint. You might notice that they come in different colors. Some like Betelgeuse in the top left are bright and red. Others like Rigel in the lower right faint or bright and blue. And in that observation lies the sea that leads to understanding the stars. You might also ask whether there is some sort of relationship between the brightness and the color. And if so, what can that tell us about the stars? Now, when most of us go looking for a relationship, we might head to Match.com. But a scientist makes a graph. This graph has brightness on one side and color on the other. If we go out and measure the brightness and color of stars, we'll put them on this plot. The way we do that is we make a line at the measured brightness value. We make a vertical cut where the color is. Where those lines intersect, we place a single point, representing the measurement for one single star. We repeat that process for a group of stars, and we look to see what pattern emerges. We end up with a diagram that has blue stars at the left, red stars at the right, bright things at the top, faint things at the bottom. A diagram like this allows us to see at a glance whether there's a relationship between the color and the brightness. Now we need some data. A good place to start is this group of stars known as the Pleiades, not far in the sky from Orion. This is a group of stars that all formed at the same time in the same place. So it's an ideal starting point for this type of question to be answered. So what would we see if we took the brightness of these stars and their color and put them onto a graph? That happens to be exactly the question that the Danish astronomer Hans Rosenberg asked back in 1910. This is his hand-drawn diagram, the first of its kind to be published. And there's an aha moment in here. He noticed that the brightest stars at the top are all blue, and the faintest objects are all red. That turns out to be an important insight. And this type of diagram that relates the color and the brightness of the stars eventually emerges as one of the most important in all of observation of astronomy. Now today we have better equipment than was available 100 years ago, but here's a modern equivalent of that diagram of the stars in the Pleiades. You can see there's a clear relationship between the brightness and the color. The bright objects are blue, the faint objects are red. And you might ask, is this a general property of the stars? Do we see this if we look at any random group of stars? Let's find out. We can take a group of 4,000 stars all across the sky and make a similar diagram for them. This is that diagram, and oops, there's no relationship there. It's a mess. Why is that? Well, think for a moment about how brightness and color relate to distance. Does the color of something change if it's close to you or far away? No. But the brightness definitely changes. A 
light close to you looks much brighter than that same light taken further away. In this case, we're looking at stars that are close and stars that are far away, all mixed together in one diagram. Perhaps that's causing some scatter that hides any relationship that might be underlying. We happen to know the distances to these stars, so we can ask, what would we see if we were to take all these stars and put them the same distance away, just like we did with the Pleiades stars? And in that case, the diagram transforms, and at the end, suddenly, you have a similar relationship to what you saw in the Pleiades. You have bright blue objects at one side and faint red objects at the other. But there's something else there that wasn't there before, a group of stars that's bright and red. So this type of diagram has interesting insights to offer. This type of diagram has a special name. It was first used to study the stars by two independent astronomers. This astronomer, Reiner Herzfeld, working in Denmark, and his counterpart, Henry Norris Russell, in the US. Today, we call it the herzfeld russell diagram in their honor, or just the HR diagram for short. To understand this diagram, you need to know something about color and what it means in terms of stars. In our everyday existence, we think of Blue is referring to cold, like ice, and red is referring to hot, like fire. But in stars, the opposite is true. In stars, we have the coolest stars are red, and the warmest stars are blue. So you can think of this diagram as separating stars into various groups. Hot and bright objects in the upper left. Cool and bright objects in the upper right. Hot and dim objects in the lower left. Cool and dim objects in the lower right. With that in mind, take another look at the graph. What do you see? Well, one thing that jumps out at you is that there are areas of the diagram with no stars. And the stars are concentrated in various places. And in fact, 90% of all the stars lie in a particular band that goes from bright and blue down to faint and red, just like in the Pleiades. We have a special name for that. We call it the main sequence of stars. And today, we understand that this is a place where stars spend the majority of their lifetimes. To understand the main sequence, you need to understand why stars shine. Stars are big balls of hydrogen. In their centers, the temperatures and pressures are incredible, so high that they can force atoms of hydrogen together, crush them, fuse them into helium, and in the process, release vast amounts of energy that work its way out and ultimately come out as light. That's how stars shine. So the main sequence is where stars spend most of their lifetime. Well, why then do we have blue stars and yellow stars and red stars in the main sequence? What determines where a star lives. It's its mass. Each star is born with a particular amount of matter, and that determines whether it will live out its life as a particular kind of star. Take, for example, the sun. It will spend its life as a moderately bright star of yellow color, whereas an object much more massive, like the star Rigel, 20 times as massive as the sun, will spend its life as a bright blue object. And in contrast, the least massive stars, the ones that can just barely turn on, about a tenth the mass of the sun, will spend their lifetimes as faint red objects. So the main sequence of stars is a mass sequence. Now there's something else in this diagram besides the main sequence. We have in the upper right supergiant and giant stars, and in the lower left we have white dwarfs. How did they connect to the main sequence? Today we know that these types of objects are the endpoints of star lifetime. After a star has run out of fuel, as it will eventually do, it leaves the main sequence. Take the star Rigel, for example. When it runs out of hydrogen, it will expand and cool, become 100 times larger than it originally was. And it will become a supergiant, and then eventually end its life the giant explosion that leaves behind either a neutron star or a black hole. The fate is different for the sun. When the sun reaches the end of its main sequence lifetime, it runs out of hydrogen it will also expand to become a bigger star. It will become a red giant. That will be a bad day for the ancestors or the, uh, the descendants of this left here on Earth because our oceans will boil away. But uh, eventually it will become a white dwarf, curling off its outer layers to leave behind a hot, dense core that will cool over time. So there are two things that determine where a star lives in the age of our diagram. One, the mass, the second, the Unfortunately, we don't live long enough to see stars go through this process, so we need to predict what stars will do, which we can do using the computer and the laws of physics. So consider the lifetimes of three stars. How would they change in brightness and color over time? Take a star ten times brighter than the sun, one about the size of the sun, and one much smaller. 
what would they do? What would their lives look like? Well, consider first the biggest sun, the 10 times the sun star. You might think this has so much mass that we have the longest life, but actually the opposite is true. Because it's so massive, it burns to its energy very quickly. And if we start the clock running here, then we'll see that it starts on the main sequence, shown by the green line, but over time, as it burns through its energy reserves, in just 20 million years, it starts to leave the main sequence, becomes a red supergiant, starts to burn helium, runs out of that, and then explodes. It's like it's over. The sun, in contrast, will live much longer. It can happily burn its hydrogen reserves for up to 10 billion years before it runs out. Then it, too, will expand to become a red giant, and then end its life as well. The biggest stars, they can burn practically forever. A star one-third of the mass of the sun can live for 100 billion or even trillion years in the case of the biggest star. So in the course of this, there are 30 billion years simulation that changes the world. So stars evolve differently because they have different masses. So that's what the HR diagram does. It connects all the different types of objects in the HR diagram to explain how they evolve. There's a second thing the HR diagram does. It allows you to use that information out stars of different mass evolve to measure the ages of things. We think all stars begin their lives and include clusters of the deities. And here's a simulation of what happens over time. These clusters of stars will naturally have stars of different masses, some very massive, some very light. So they will evolve at different rates. Here's what we would see. Here's a simulation of a cluster evolving over time. What you'll see when we start the clock ticking is the massive stars will almost immediately vanish. They start to explode, they become supernovae. And over time, stars of lower and lower mass run out of energy and begin to evolve off the main sequence, becoming red giants, and then turning into red dwarfs. And there's a particular point where stars are leaving the main sequence, that orange line, and moving off to become red giants. It's called the turnoff, the main sequence turnoff. And over time, that position moves down like a candle burning down over time. And we can use that information to compare the ages of for example, take one cluster of stars and figure out where its turnoff is, shown by the blue arrow here. You can compare it to another group of stars, shown in red, which has its turnoff at a different place. You can see that that red group of stars is lacking the young, hot blue stars that are still present in the blue cluster. Therefore, the red group is older. The blue one is younger. So the HR diagram allows us to determine which things are younger and which are older, and that tells us something about how there's a third important thing the HR diagram does, and that is it allows us to measure the distances to things. The HR diagram tells us where the main sequence of stars should be, what the brightness of those things should be if they're at a certain distance from the Earth. So you can take a random group of stars, like the Pleiades, for example, and you can compare the position of their main sequence to the position predicted by the HR diagram. In this case, we see that these stars appear fainter than we predicted. That blue line shows the difference in the brightness. That's due to the difference in the distance. There's something called the inverse square law that says if you take an object and move it to twice its distance, it looks one quarter as bright. So you can use that piece of scientific knowledge to translate that brightness, distance, brightness difference into a distance difference and thereby determine the distance to a group of stars. Fortunately, the Milky Way galaxy is littered with clusters of stars, all different shapes and sizes. All over the place. Each one of them is a potential signpost on a map that allows us to trace out where the star lines and other features of the galaxy are. For a century, astronomers have used this and other techniques to map out our galaxy and paint a picture of what it looks like. Today, this is our understanding of what the galaxy resembles. This is not our view, this is the view somebody would have from outside of our galaxy looking in. We see that it's a grand design spiral galaxy with a central bar, and it's so vast that it takes like 100,000 years to go from one side to the other. We know that our place in the galaxy is about two-thirds of the way out from the center to the edge. And we even know that in the center of our galaxy, and it's hard, lies a supermassive black hole. And as my colleague Jason Chin will explain to you later today, we can use powerful telescopes like Keck, equipped with adaptive optics and laser guide stars, to study the motions of stars as they whip around that black hole and measure its mass. Understanding this galaxy, the Milky Way, and our place within it, stands as one of the supreme intellectual achievements in all of science. And the reason we've been able to make this progress is because of our understanding of stars through the HR diagram. It's a tool that's essential to the science of astronomy 
this periodic table of elements is the chemistry. So the next time you go outside at night, behold the majesty of the Milky Way above, but also pay attention to the stars. Note that some are bright, others make some red, some blue. For in that simple observation lies the seed that leads to understanding the whole galaxy.